super excited and very grateful for Jeff Brown to, hear that? Um, to join us today. Um, Jeff has been Hold on, station half manager of the image is kind of blocked. Why is that? Uh, the, oh yeah, is, is that better? It is. Yeah. Okay. And Creek Field Station, a research and teaching facility of UC Berkeley. He retired this year. Sage Hen was established in 1951 with the signing of a long-term special use permit from the Tahoe National Forest within the basis for research and teaching. Research activities are multidisciplinary and on-site facilities are occupied year round. Flora, fauna, and insects of the area have been well studied and there is substantial climate and hydrological data collected since the 50s. Um, Jeff is an experienced director with a demonstrated history of working in high education, um, in higher education, strong professional skills in nonprofit organizations, environmental awareness, fundraising, strategic planning and research, um, focusing efforts and creative collaborative opportunities to engage the power of the arts in effective social change. Currently focused on addressing issues related to holistic approaches to managing the ecosystem function of Sierra forests. So, um, so uh, um, we distributed the, um, the article um, from the New Yorker um, that profiles um, Jeff's work uh, over multiple decades. And um, Jeff, if you could talk a little bit about where it started. Um, yeah, again, the kind of conventional thought about what would be the best way to manage um, uh, woodlands in California and how you um, uh, tireless, tirelessly <laughs> tried to shift the thinking on that and um, your, your innovative way of thinking about uh, forest management. Great. So maybe what I ought to do is just tell the story um, and then um, you can prod me on pieces you think I may have missed or that you want more information. And then you may be about a half hour of that. Um, and then we can go into any questions that you guys might have. Um, does that make sense? Perfect. Okay, great. So let's go back to several thousand years when we had a different group of people that were managing this system. And so the Native Americans were interesting in that they really didn't live in the forest. They would move into the forest um, during the season, the summer season. <clears throat> and then in the fall, they light it on fire um, when they would go away to wherever it is they make it through the winter. Um, and they did this very well for thousands and thousands of years. So the system adapted to having regular return interval of fire. And the kind of fire that they were experiencing back then was what we would call low intensity. It would just kind of creep and smolder. And how do we know that that was true? Well, one of the things that we did at Sage Hen was because we're on the east side of the Sierras, which is very dry in the summer, we really have a, a super slow rate of decay. So when the Europeans arrived and pretty much clear cut this part of the world, we still have those stumps around. I mean, they're a little bit desiccated, but by coring those or wedging them, we were able to get the fire history. And what did we learn? Well, we learned that pre-European arrival, the mean return interval for fire was around 2.4 years. It was low intensity um, and small in size. Post-European, it went to a 20 something year cycle, much larger size fires and uh, much hotter. So when they put the Transcontinental Railroad through the US, it went through Truckee which is eight miles due south of the Sage Hen Basin. Um, and they pretty much viewed that this West as this wild place, this natural wilderness. Um, and what had happened was there were millions of people that were living in California before the Europeans arrived. <laughs> and a lot of them went away um, because the disease, you know, reached the state or what's now the state long before the other kinds of humans showed up. Um, and so their populations were reasonably well decimated. And so thus, when the Europeans arrived, they thought that they were seeing a natural 
wild place, but they weren't. They were really seeing a topography that had been very heavily managed. And because of the regular return of fire, um, the understory, the stuff that lives on the ground, um, was, was like the maid lived there. And so the maid would keep this duff from building up. And so you'd have these slow creeping little ground fires. You wouldn't have a whole lot of little trees. You'd have some, you'd have this patchiness and you didn't create the series you need to create a big fire. So we get here and we clear cut it. We view it as a commodity. You know, we use the lumber to create these railroads. We use the lumber to create the infrastructure to support that. And we started building our communities right smack dab in the middle of these forests. And that was the first cut. Um, and then years later, they found silver in Nevada and gold in California. And that was the next cut because they needed that lumber to shore up the mines and to build the communities in which would house the people that lived there. So, and, you know, so everything was reduced to the same time, you know, it became pretty homogenous. So they would all start growing from zero every time they get clear cut. And the other thing they did was that they only took out the good stuff. They didn't take out the tops, the limbs, you know, all the lumber that they didn't use, the stuff that was cracked, they, they just left it on the ground. So we arrived at Sage Chen in 2001, and I thought I was a pretty strong, um, strong, staunch supporter of the environment. And I was the very strong belief that if you cut down one tree, you were doing something wrong. Um, and Sage Chen is owned by the UC Regents. The facility, the structures, the infrastructure, but the land is managed and owned by the public and managed by the US Forest Service. And so we're a permittee. And, you know, these sorts of things are relationships between humans. And, you know, if you've ever been in a relationship, you know that there's is kind of a roller coaster ride. There's the easy times and then there's the challenging times. And um, that's how the relationship between the field station and the Forest Service had been for the 50 plus years before we got to Sage Hen. So we get there and our first summer was a surprise. So we moved to Sage Hen from uh, Moab, Utah. Moab is kind of what we consider our home. Um, and it's a little way different world. <laughs> You know, and our first summer, there were three large forest fires outside of, and around Sage Hen. So we lived in smoke for our first summer. Um, and we quickly realized that because of the length of the data at Sage Hen, um, what we thought was really important was to try to protect that data set. Um, there are a lot of places to study the after effect of a standard place in fire. And we thought it was important to try to have a green place with data from which to learn how the system functions and then hopefully try to use that information to help us try to regain try to reclaim some of that ecosystem function that we think we've lost over time and so every time i go to a meeting with the forest service you know they always had the timber people there and they were always talking about cutting down trees and, the kind of trees they were talking about cutting down weren't the small stuff. They were the bigger trees. So if you were to build a campfire, I mean, I'm sure everybody's built a campfire. Um, you know that you don't take a big log and throw it in the ring and put the match to it. It does not burn. So you start out with little stuff and then you have a little bit bigger stuff and a little bit bigger stuff and a little bit bigger stuff. And then ultimately you can put the big thing on there. And by lighting the little stuff, which burns, you know, you can get it to stair step up and actually get the larger stuff to, to burn. So if you drive around a California forest and look at it, we have built a multi-million acre campfire because we have heavy layer of duff, the little stuff. We have little, all kinds of different sized trees that just stair step their way up to the end of the canopy. And so whenever you do get an ignition, these things take off. And the other thing that's happened, in, in 2001, we noticed a significant shift in the kind of fire that we were now experiencing in our new world. And there are what they call fuel moistures. So if you take a piece of wood um, and 
it, it'll, it'll have a certain amount of moisture. And if it's got a certain percentage of, of moisture, it's very difficult to get it to burn. And so when they're using the, doing these prescriptions to try to figure out you know, what, what we needed to try to work towards, they have a, a rolling 10 year average of you know, climate data, fuel moisture, all those sorts of things. Um, and then that helps you come up with a, per, a percentile. And so pre-2001, um, the, these fires were burning in the, around the 90th percentile. And so the design for forest management was really in the low 90s because that was the challenge that they're trying to deal with. Well, when we clear cut the place and the timber and the industry was kind of driving it and the public demand was for wood, um, that was the emphasis. It was solely one thing is to maximize the number of two by fours you can pull out of the system. Well, the public didn't like that because the public was thinking that, you know, we really need to be managing these things more as an ecosystem because there's a lot more involved than just growing boards. Um, and so the environmental groups started forming up and lining up and they got the National Environmental Policy Act passed. You know, they got the Endangered Species Clean Air Act, clean, you know, all those things came into being and they got really good at stopping every project the Forest Service proposed because those were only to do one thing and that was to pull out two by fours. Um, and so as a result, very little thinning occurred on the forest. And remember what they were taking out was the big stuff, not the little stuff. And they were leaving everything else again on the ground. And what happened there? Bear with me here a sec. Something just okay. popped up. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm back. And so, um, you know, everybody was really frustrated. The industry started shutting down. You know, they started pulling mills out. You know, they started moving their emphasis, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, other places to get timber. Um, and so a lot of the infrastructure that used to exist in California is no longer there. And so it took us a couple of years, but I finally started seeing and believing that it's okay to cut a tree, <laughs> that maybe we need to be thinking a little bit differently than we were because we, 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 aren't, we weren't winning and we aren't winning. You know, and, and every time now that we're seeing these large fires, um, they're, they're burning a big hole. So if you burn little holes, little patchy holes, you can get the reseeding, the, it can, it, the system can infill itself and recover. But when you build a big hole, when you burn in a huge hole and you cook and you consume all of the, the seed stock, um, it's really hard to get the middle back like it, what it was because the holes are too big. And there was an opportunity then to figure out how SageHen could help. So, we're not academics. I have a bachelor's of science in business services. So I like to say I have a BS and BS. <laughs> and I figured out that if Satan was to be successful, maybe it could help provide the people that we worked with, the agency, with better information from which to make their decisions. Because when, when, you, when you learn about their job, you know, it's like many of our jobs. It's, you know, we're dealing, we're putting out little fires all the time we really don't have a whole lot of time and energy to invest in thinking and in learning. Um, and thus we're making a lot of just really quick decisions and the decisions that we're making may not be best, may not be based on the best, most current information that's available because it takes a lot of time to cull, you know, a lot of papers. <laughs> um, and you don't have that if you're at that level of, of, of an agency. So we're thinking maybe we could help, by trying to get them some good information to think about. And at the time, um, they were noticing that these larger, these new style larger fires, when they would move through the landscape, would hit a place that had been, that was more open and it would slow the fire down, bring it to the ground and then kind of work around it. So it would create kind of a, a rain shadow effect on the, on the lee side of where these fires were occurring. 
And they were thinking, well, maybe if we did this kind of thinning that we might be able to interrupt and interfere and change fire behavior. And so, again, I mentioned that, you know, no projects are getting approved. So this isn't going to fly. So they came up with a strategy called SPLATS, um, Strategically Placed Land Area Treatments. And the idea was, if you were, let's imagine a monster truck with these huge tires on it. And the lugs on the tires are about 150 acres in size, are rectangular in shape. And you did the lugs so that, you know, where the prevailing winds come from, and in, in our part of the world, in the Sierras, most of our fires, the wind is being driven from the south, southwest, or from the north. So if you put the lugs in, you know, so that you always had a, a, a wide surface, depending on where the fires come from, and if you drove that monster truck across a landscape, that pattern, if you thin that pattern, you know, that might interrupt fire behavior. And so we said, okay, well, does it work um, in a place that's got topography and trees? So the only actual um, work that had been done to test this theory was in Western Utah in a cheatgrass desert, flat. And they tilled, you know, the rectangles, they put fire through it, per performed spectacularly. Well, does that translate into this with these? Um, and I was thinking, well, maybe this is how we can help. So I started doing some research um, and I found two folks and they just happened to be at Berkeley. Um, a guy named John Battles, who's a forest ecologist and another guy named Scott Stevens, who's a fire ecologist. And I approached them and said, hey, you know, are you guys interested in this? And they said, absolutely. So we strategically partnered them with our Forest Service District Rangers. So I don't know if you know much about the Forest Service, but they're like the military. You know, they've got the high command and then they've got all these steps that move their way down. So there's the region. So California happens to be a region of the Forest Service, Region 5. Within that region, they get subgroups. Those are called national forests. So you'll see they have different names. And within those forests, they have ranger districts. So they just keep parsing down you know, parsing it down into smaller sizes. And the person in charge of the district is a ranger um, called the district ranger. So a woman by the name of Joanne Robique was our district ranger. We're on the Truckee Ranger District. Um, and the three of them went after some money from the Joint Fire Sciences Program. And what the science people wanted was to get the best data set they could of a Western forest. And can you do screen share? Because um, I've got a thing I'd like to pop up. Let's see, uh, David, are you the um, host? Can, can you make Jeff the co-host so he can screen share? Oh, okay, you should be able to now. Okay, I'll see if I can find it. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll keep talking while I keep looking okay. around. Okay, okay. Um, Oh, well. Um, so they, they got a bunch of money and they were thinking that if they had a really good data set, then they could use that to inform the computer models that, they, that everybody uses for fighting a fire. Um, and so what they did at Sage Hen, so Sage Hen um, is on the east side of the Sierras. Uh, the western end of it, it runs pretty much from west to east. It's about eight miles long, the basin. Um, and it starts at about 8,900. Uh, the west end, the high part, and goes down to around 6,000 feet in that eight mile stretch. And it starts in a wetter zone and it dries out. So you can see the change in vegetation as you move through the basin. Um, and it's also on the, on the lee side. So it's on the rain shadow side of the crest. So the middle of the basin gets about half the water that the west end of the basin gets and the east end of the basin gets about half the precipitation that the middle of the basin gets. So you can really see how the, the rain shadow effect works at Sage Hen. And so they took that 9,000 acres and they picked a point, randomly selected a point, and then they set a series of plots every 500 meters across the entire watershed. So there's 531 permanent plots within the Sage Hen Basin. Each of them is 500 square meters in size. Um, and every tree 
is individually tagged, numbered species. Um, we mapped out the understory. We randomly selected three two meter wide radii. We classified the ground fuels into four size classes. It's the best data set of a forest in the Western United States. And it just so happens that during that time was when airborne LIDAR was being developed. Um, and because of this really good data set of a forest, um, Sagehead was one of the places that was used to actually calibrate airborne LIDAR. Uh, it's just by happenstance. So now we're starting to get these different tools and we'll, what we were noticing. So when John Battles was taking this data that we had and dumping it into the models, uh, we were getting way different results than what the Forest Service would get when they were using their data. And we were concerned that we were going to look like fools in <laughs> the Forest Service. So uh, when a Forest Service person goes out and looks at and tries to classify the forest, to get the code that they would then input into the model to get it to burn, um, they have a little flip chart book. Um, and the book has all the different kinds of pieces of a forest. <clears throat> and you would go in there and you would stand there and you would look at the forest and you would flip through. And when you found the picture that kind of matched what you were seeing, you know, and then there'd be some more information, you could then pull the code out. And that was then what you would dump into the data that you would then inform the model from. And it was really fun because for about a year when the science side and the management side were at meetings, you could see that there was no, there was no camaraderie. There was really no respect. I mean, that's probably a bad word, but you know, the, the land managers, they're the expert. They know how to manage the land, you know, so their brain sits there hard. And the science folks, they're just trying to do their science stuff. And, you know, everybody just kind of wanted to get through this. So there really wasn't this cross, this connecting that it takes to really get things to shift. And I'm going, well, John, why don't we go out into the forest with their people and we'll all have this little flip chart book and we'll just stand there and we'll just see if we can, if we're on the same page if we're looking at the forest through the same lens. And so we did. And the other thing that we noticed when we started sharing our modeling runs with them is that we learned that they really didn't trust their models because the results that they were getting really didn't match what they were seeing on the ground. So as we're standing there flipping through the book, we realized that we were all on the same page. And then it was like, well, maybe it's not us against each other. Maybe we can work together to try to make this a better tool that they would have more confidence in in doing their jobs. And that was a pivotal moment. That was a big deal. Um, because from then on, we now had this mutual respectful relationship between the science side and the management side. And that was really critical. And then it's like, okay, we get all this data, you know, we start burning the place, you know, we've got the fire history of it. Um, and a fire, a big fire happened at South Lake Tahoe and it was pretty devastating and it burned in the 99th percentile, but yet we're managing planning for 91, 92 percentile. So we had just done all of our modeling runs and you know, the, we were thinking about, we were testing this splat concept. So we're seeing that if we did this thin, if we did splats, that yes, it would absolutely interrupt fire behavior. So if a fire slammed into an area that had been splatted, it would bring the fire to the ground, slow it down. And if a fire started in an area that had been splatted, it wouldn't take off and get into the canopy and go. So I called John up, I said, hey John, did you hear about this Angor fire? He said, yeah. I said, let's throw that, those climate parameters into this, into Sagehen and burn us to see if we're actually making things better or if we're making things worse. So he did, and it's like, it, the good thing was is that we weren't, we weren't making them worse. We were making them better, but not as better as, as well as we thought we were gonna get them to, to go. And so then that was done, and Nicole Vallant got her PhD out of it, and everybody's going, Jeff, let's splat Sage Hen. And I said, well, 
you know, we really don't want to do that because that's again managing for one thing. And this we're not, now we're in the early 2000s, you know, 2004, and the Forest Service approached us and said, "Hey, you know, our our permit is for 451 acres, so pretty much the riparian zone and the road into where the field station is." And they came to us and said, hey, what do you guys think about getting the whole watershed, the whole 9,000 acres? And I said, okay, what does that mean? They said, well, we would designate you as an experimental forest, or at least that piece of land. And that shifts management responsibility. So the Forest Service is basically three agencies under one chief. There's a national forest system, which everybody thinks of as the Forest Service. There's the research side of the Forest Service. And then there's a very small piece that's public-private partnerships. Um, and that was formed because they didn't, really didn't want the, the national forest system talking to private landowners because they didn't want the, the Fed telling people what to do. So they created this other group that was the official way that, to share information or to, or to cross talk. But none of these three groups really talk to each other. Um, and so when you're in the national forest system, it's, it gets managed as forest service land. Once the signature authority shifts to the research side, then that piece of property, the signature authority rests with the research side. So we thought that was a good idea, but all the previous experimental forests really were made for one or two things. They were really designed to study water or build, grow two by fours. And we go, this is really interesting, but Satan's really kind of been about studying the place. You know, why don't we make the purpose of the Satan experimental forest to understand how the system works and then use that information to inform us to help us figure out how to try to get some eco ecosystem function back. In other words, improve it ecologically. And so they did that. So we became the Centennial Experimental Forest. So the previous, the most recent experimental forest was from the 60s. So we had to figure out how to do that again, but we did and that was great. So now we're starting to see the value of working closely together to try to help everybody understand things differently and maybe act a little bit differently. And then when they said, well, let's flat say 10, we say, well, that really doesn't meet what the goal is, the objective is for this forest. I said, why don't we think about what we might do that would be more holistic in approach? In other words, get this system function back. And the, Scott Stevens is interesting um, because he wasn't tenured yet. And he was doing a lot of work in Mexico, in the Mexico National Park called the San Pedro del Martir. And that was what they believed Calif Sierra Forest used to look like. Um, and it had not been harvested, it had not been logged, and they really hadn't been suppressing fire. And so uh, that was, this is early 2000s. So this is when the San Bernardino died and burned up. You know, the drought, you know, it, 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 the whole Southern California forests are, are just literally unraveling. Um, and John or Scott had heard that there was a fire that ran through um, the San Pedro del Martir. So he's like, there goes my career. <laughs> he was working on about a 10,000 10, acre size piece of, of, of the forest. So he ran down there and he said, it was beautiful. He said, it was like the maid came through. He said, there was less than 1% mortality. Um, it cleaned up the understory nicely, removed a lot of that, those ladder fuels that I described earlier. He said it was, it was just beautiful. And he also said that if you looked at the metrics that the, so the Forest Service has all these things that they say. So when we manage, we manage to have X number of stems. So a tree trunk is a stem. We have X amount of stems per acre. We have X amount of canopy closure, so only certain X amount of sun hits the ground. You know, you know, so they have all these metrics. And what Scott was noticing was that if he took the San Pedro, that 10,000 acres down there, and got it to the acre, the metrics match the Forest Service's spec exactly. So now let's think a little bit about topography. So if you have a steep south-facing slope, it's gonna be drier because the sun bakes it more. Um, which means it's going to be able to provide less water to stuff that uses water. So on a south-facing steeper slope, you're going to have less there where the system can support less. Also, we notice that because it's south-facing, it's drier and hotter, that fire moves very quickly through a south-facing slope. On a northern-facing slope, you know, there's pockets where it's kind of moister, 
Um, you'll have different kinds of things living there, um, and it can support more bio, you know, more stuff, um, more plants, more critters, whatever. Um, but the prescription from the Forest Service is every acre is the same. Um, and it is designed so that if they get sued, that you can go stand in that anywhere and you can match the metrics. And so what's, what Scott was saying was, well, wait a minute, you know, the San Pedro Martir matches that. But if you walk around the San Pedro Martir, very rarely are you going to find an acre that meets those requirements. It's just you need to be thinking about it across the larger landscape and bring it back down to the acre that way and allow this patchiness and this variableness into the system because that's how the system survives. That's how it works. And if you think about it, um, if you do everything the same and you have a fire, it, it pretty much all goes. Um, whereas if you have this patchiness in the system, you know, you're probably not going to have full destruction. You know, you're going to have parts of it survive. And that kind of helps think about how the system had been managed for thousands of years before we got here. And so we, I go, well, why don't we invite, so A, that we know that the agency doesn't have the expertise to do this. And we know the science folks don't have the expertise to do this. Maybe it makes sense to bring a whole bunch of people together to see if we could do this collaborative design. And the idea was if, if we could get everybody to agree on the problem, and then if we were to set up a system for moving through that, um, what would happen? So we did, and we had, um, we had all the Fed agencies there, we had all the state agencies there, we had a lot of NGOs, you know, nonprofits, folks interested in forests. Um, we had the environmental interests there, we had the timber industry people there, and we had concerned citizens. And we went through about a year and a half process. And the first thing we did was we went to Seichen. We said, what do you guys think? They said, this place is a mess. <laughs> we said, okay, what do we do? And they said, well, show us your plan. So with NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, typically they would go, okay, one, they would come up with three things, three plans that they could implement. One, do nothing. That's always one. Do what we think we should do. And then they'd always throw in a third one and say, you pick. Um, and they'd always sign off on their choice. So, you know, NEPA really wasn't being used. And so the environmentals realized that and they're like, well, we're not even engaged in any kind of process. We're just going to wait till it goes to decision. And then we're just going to shut them down in court. What best way to use their resources. So we thought it'd be critical to make sure that the enviros, the environmental groups, um, had a strong voice in, in the planning of these things. And so we invited this guy, Craig Thomas, from Sierra Forest Legacy, who was one of the big groups um, in. in. He, we brought him in because I wanted to, A, make sure that we're going to be doing stuff that's environmentally sound. And also, different people will bring in way different perspectives than that you, that you, that, that you might have. And you might end up with a better outcome. So we did that. And so when we asked them what we should do and they said, show us your plan, we said, we didn't have a plan and they didn't believe us, rightly so. And we said, well, we have a map, you know? And so we did, we had a map of SAGEN and um, because of the Endangered Species Act, um, SAGEN has four active goshawk packs, a northern goshawk, a bird. So basically you, you do nothing in, a, in the 400 whatever acres you carve out a running nest. And then we have a California spotted owl. So we didn't want to do anything in that habitat. So those were the only sideboards that we had on this. And it took us a full day for people to realize that we, we really didn't have a plan that we're going to try to jam down their throats, that we really did want their input. So I went through that process and it was awesome. Um, Scott uh, Conway, who is the Forest Service veg vegetation management person, he said, well, you know, we're using these terms in all of our meetings. He said, but what kind of picture does it that paint in your brain? So he said, I better do some little plots, demonstrations, and then we can use those to calibrate the words we're using and the images, because we could all be using the same word. And when we go see it, whoa, I don't like that. So we did, and we actually used that as a great way to calibrate our terminology um, and to make sure that we were all on the same page. Um, and so we, were, we had done this, we'd written the whole thing up, and the Friday before our last collaborative meeting, 
Um, Joanne, the ranger, calls me up and said, hey, Jeff, I have new information. I could tell from her voice that she wasn't happy. I said, oh, God, <laughs> what is it? She said, well, Jeff, we found a gossock nest babies in the middle of the most important unit to this whole project. So in our mind, we're dead. We're completely dead in the water. So, so she says, what do we do? I said, well, come Monday, we just share the information with the group, see what they think. Monday rolls up, we're all there standing in a big circle, celebrating this year and a half experience that we've had because it was really positive. Then Joanne shares the new information and you could just watch the energy just crash. We're all just figured out we just wasted that year and a half. So I look at Craig Thomas. I say, Craig, hey, what do you think? He goes, well, he said, this, this has not been a waste. He says, we've done two things here. Um, and any one of them on their own is worth the effort. He said, one, we've shown that land managers and scientists and the public can work together. He said, that is a big shift. He said, the other thing is, he says, what we're trying to do here is to make this place better for everything, not just one thing. He said, and this is a quote, I can't see how we can let this bird get in the way of this project moving forward. Naturally, we wouldn't want to be doing anything, you know, the birds move through. So they're only there for the nesting season, then they're gone. So naturally, we wouldn't want to be doing work when they're there, but we could definitely do work when they weren't there. And so that really was good for me to hear because it convinced me that we're on the right track. Um, so they went through the NEPA process, which is closed door. You know, nobody can be part of that. The, and, you know, that's a chance for a surprise. Um, the document came out. It matched. It was what we had written it as a group. Um, all the prescriptions matched what we had all suggested. Um, it went to decision. They were in the public comment process. They got three letters the f timber industry in support, the environmentalists in support, and the University of California in support. No negative letters. Only time that's ever happened. And it's the only time these three groups had ever agreed on anything. <laughs> so that was, that was really positive. And I think that started giving us some cred. I mean, we, there was a big project um, on, the west, on, the, uh, yeah, on the west side um, that was a big collaborative effort. It was well-funded. Um, it went through collaboration. The NEPA doc came out, didn't match. It, it, it imploded. Whereas we're, you know, this grassroots thing and, and it worked. So then it was like, okay, I thought we were done. You know, I said, we succeeded. Now we'll just, we'll just do this. Well, we, ain't, we weren't done. Um, we don't have a timber industry left. So we have really very few people that could actually take trees out. Um, and the timber industry that we do have left still only can work on big trees. So it's like, oh, wow, now we have to step up and solve this other problem. And then we are starting now to work with more forest service, like the Lake Tahoe Basin. Um, they launched a big collaborative for the West Shore based on what we did at Sage Hen. So we're part of that. And the Sierra Nevada Conservancy is now an, an agency. And they're starting to get a lot of bond money to spend on forest work. And so we're now in a group thinking about a larger landscape, the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative, the TCSI, which is about oh, 2.4 million acres. So when you look at our fires, there are hundreds of thousands of acres now. So in the last couple of years, the veracity of these things and the destructiveness of these things has almost increased an order of magnitude from one year to the next. I mean, the fires that we saw this year, I mean, we thought the fires last year were pretty, you know, awe-inspiring. Awe what this year makes last year's look like nothing. And so we're, this whole thing is being exacerbated by climate change. You know, we're drying up. I don't, we don't need to argue about what's causing it, but the climate's shifting. Um, we also were very interested in having the Native Americans' perspective. And, a really interesting um, Native American woman I had a chance to, to meet said, you know, smoke plays an ecological role. So if you look at all the grand masters paintings of the American West, you know, when they're trying to get everybody to move out West, they send all the painters out. So if you look at those paintings, you always see a haze in the valleys. And that was because they were always, there was always something burning in low intensity, creating this little bit of smoke. And she said, you know, I'm, she's convinced that smoke actually plays an ecological role. 
And she said it also because it diffuses light um, also would help keep the ground from heating up as much. So it's like, anybody doing any work on that? And it's like, well, no. So maybe we had to start thinking about that. So we then now are getting a, a larger voice. So we're now working at the agents at the state agency level. Um, you know, I, I don't know why I, they invited me to these things, but I was probably the, the one who wouldn't speak agency, agency ease and would come in without a whole lot of sidebars. So I think probably I was involved because I could tell them what I thought. Um, and I think th they need that. Um, and they actually want that because they're not going to do it. I mean, you know, they're, they, they're under really tight rules. Um, and I think that was helpful. And, you know, if, if you notice, um, the state and the forest service just agreed to manage California forests collaboratively and for ecosystem function, big step. Um, so now all of a sudden it's like, who's going to get this money from the state to do this work? And it was like, well, we are the first. So the University of California, we're the first ones to get bond money to burn. <laughs> so figure that out. You know, you guys work for an academic institution. You know, how do you do that grant-wise? So it took us a year to, to try to figure out how we could put these agreements. It took the Forest Service two weeks to come up with an agreement with us. It took us a year to figure it out, but we did. So we, you know, Sagen now has a bunch of money to spend on thinning and burning. So say Chen, you know, now all, everything's been thinned. Um, we're slowly starting to get the fire on the ground, but that's hard. Um, the public hates smoke, you know, even if it's low level smoke. So, you know, we need, we need another shift. You know, we need a, a cultural shift. And so that's where the arts rolls in. So I think of this problem as having five different things and I'll just do them alphabetically. We need to shift culture. And the way you shift culture is through the arts. That's where you can get culture to shift. <clears throat> we need the business. We need an industry that can deal with the material that we need, we need to pull out to return function. And that's small diameter timber. Um, we need management. We need the people who are managing these forests to think the same and to think across broad landscapes so that these things work together not against each other. Policy, we need to make sure that our policy, the, the laws and regulations and all those things are moving at the same speed of these other things so that they don't become roadblocks and stop it. And then we need the science, you know, we gotta have, we gotta continue to collect the data and we gotta process it. And we need to figure out if we're doing a good thing or if we're doing a bad thing. I mean, I don't know if we're doing the right thing. Time will tell. And so we are field station. And so we're part of an organization of field stations, OBFS, Organization of Biological Field Stations. So we got the National Science Foundation to fund the National Academies of Science to think about us and what we need to do to be relevant. So they came out with a great document. And this guy, Jerry Schubel, who's the, well, he just retired, but he was the head of the Aquarium Pacific in Long Beach. And Jerry's a smart guy. He said, basically, there's five steps to change. First one, you collect data, we do that. Science does that. B, you turn the data into knowledge. So we do, science does that. To fact four, which is change policy, you need step three, which is you need to create an empathetic connection. Science is specifically designed to pull emotion out. You wonder why the public does not resonate with science. It's because we, it doesn't matter to them. We don't, if you don't grab them by the heart, you know, you ain't going to get them passionate about anything. So if you can get this empathetic connection with the public, now you've got advocates. That's what leads to changing policy. And that's what then leads to real change. Hitoshi, I think uh, Ali just arrived. I'm going to let him in. Stop sharing.